it behooves all of us who are creating together to remember that part of what we are doing is creating this game and part of what we are doing is keeping our industry alive. Today we're talking about AI and how that relates to creative industries. We're joined by professional voice actor Rachel Kimsey. She is the official voice of Wonder Woman in the Justice League action cartoon series, as well as Rachel Kane from Call of Duty Black Ops 3, including Alice from Genshin Impact and Claire Revolt from Trails of Cold Steel. While she's done many, many other projects, we're gonna largely focus on voice acting within game dev, and we are stoked to have you. Thank you so much for coming. I'd love to kick it right off and actually hear a little bit about your day-to-day -day and what it's like to be a professional voice actor working on video games. For me, as a voice actor in games, I am lucky enough to come in after the writing and the developing and a lot of times most of the art has already been done and I get to come put a little flavor in it. In animation, most of the time we'll record the voice to an animatic or we'll record the voice and only an animatic has been done and then it gets sent to animate and it gets animated to our performances. But in gaming, it, it varies a lot. Sometimes the performances are built around us. Sometimes we come in and lay it on. Um, if I'm working in uh, a game where I'm doing localization or dubbing, uh, somebody amazing in Japan or Korea or China has already performed it and crafted that character with the game devs. And I get to come in and I get to lay my flavor on top of it within the exact same time parameters that they used <laughs> yeah. to speak, um, which is really, really fun. It's exciting. Each, each localization team gets to create um, its own style and flavor for, you know, each country, but it's already but it's built on the backs of something that someone else has already created. Um, then there are games like when I've worked on, uh, when I worked on Black Ops 3 specifically, um, where I did the motion capture. So I was the first one in the door on my character. It was all written by a brilliant team. And then the motion capture happens on stage. The animation is done to you know, the physical markers of my body and my face um, in even in the booth to record just the overcomes speech. Most of that was recorded so that that could still be animated for any of the like POV and, you know, in the corner. And then there are games where I come in and I play seven different characters and I never know any of their names. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a an Excel spreadsheet of 80 to 350 lines and it's um, sometimes prepared and sometimes a cold read and I get in there with a really skilled director who helps make who keeps the whole game in their head and helps keep me on task um, and all of them are in service of different styles and different sizes and different audiences for games and they're all really fun and it's changed a bit in the last three years, what with recent events. Um, I now do, I would say 80% of my work from this little box right here. Um, and for me, that's worked out really, really beautifully because I've got a young family and I've got a little homestead where I like to make animals and green things grow. And, um, and I get to do that uh, here without having to commute all the way into town. Um, but whenever there's motion capture, it's going directly into a studio and working in a studio setting. Something to lead us into this conversation, right, is the, the gift of technology has made it possible for us to do more stuff together with more people to create more interesting stories that will connect more with different groups. You know, we're not stuck in one kind of storytelling and to reject the gifts of technology is to assume the world is gonna stop and that's just never gonna happen. Yeah. So going forward, as things continue to change, it's how do we do it ethically? How do we do it with consideration for the people who are creating things? How do we do it with consent? And how do we do it um, so that everybody is treated fairly? What are you seeing in the land of voice acting? What are the implications for AI? Can AI replace voice actors? And is it happening already? So I'm only speaking for myself. There's a lot of fear on the part of actors about what's coming. There are people who are afraid that their jobs are gonna vanish and there's not gonna be any more work and everything is gonna become derivative and become stolen. And that fear comes from the place of 
regularly and consistently being taken advantage of as performers, especially when you're coming up in the business. It is not at all uncommon to have had, everybody's got at least one story of their work being stolen. Um, I got some good ones. Um, So that fear comes from that place. There are some kinds of voice work that are gonna vanish to AI. They are. Things like e-learning and phone trees, you, you don't, you're not going to need a person to do that anymore, given that the work generally is intended to be as neutral as possible. And um, anything that was done with, <laughs> I'm now blanking inconveniently on the name of the technology, but where actors would go in and do phonemes of sounds so that then a computer could build the words back up, mm. which is like how Siri was created. That kind of work that's going to shift over to AI almost certainly. And part of the negative implication of that is that there is so much work that's already been recorded that has already been bought out and the rights have been taken away from the performers who recorded that work. And they were already given, in my personal opinion, unethical contracts that say, we own this forever and we don't have Mm -hmm. to relicense you. Um, that that can all be given to machine learning to train an AI and it won't remunerate those actors anymore. And I think that it is a shame, but it is also a reality of the gig. Eventually, elevator operators are no longer required, right? right? But there's also work that I don't think will ever go away. You're you're never going to not want somebody famous to be yeah. in your big AAA game. So yay, celebrities are still safe. Um, you're never gonna not want skilled people who can do something with that famous people to fill out those worlds. Where we're gonna start seeing a lessening and a contraction is in probably like NPC characters or in, um, games or, or like in mobile gaming where there's less dialogue and more efforts, you know, things like that. Can you tell us what efforts means? I, I'm imagining so, it when you jump, it goes, Hoo! is that right? Efforts? So, so efforts and this is, and this is the thing, right? Um, that's somebody's job. Somebody yep. recorded it. If you heard it, somebody recorded it. It didn't come from nowhere. It's Even the little 8-bit guy yeah. that goes, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Right. Right. All those little sounds, a human being made that sound into a microphone to give life to even the simplest 2D animation games. Okay, you can absolutely use AI ethically if the performer's voice that you purchased it from has given consent, knows what they signed on for and is getting a licensing fee for it. That's totally ethical. It's totally okay for, and some actors are doing it already who have who have signed cons- with consent and knowledge their voices into some of these banks of simple sounds and efforts and, you know, kind of character neutral things that developers can use. They were compensated. Maybe they're compensated with a licensing option for each time it gets it, it gets used in something else. There are ways absolutely to ethically use this technology and for people to still get paid and for creators to still be partnering together. What is not going to be an ethical use is for the people who are like, oh man, I totally wish I had somebody who sounded just like this one actor. So I'm going to go steal a bunch of clips from their games on YouTube and f- put it into a machine learning thing and then just take it yeah there's stealing so specifically with voice acting lately because it's on the forefront of my mind i'll be watching like an anime or even just some kind of a cartoon of some kind or just like playing a video game where an npc might say something in a certain way where i was like that could totally be ai and it would you could passively play it off as ai and it would come across as like a good voice there's other things where 
like lately my wife and I have been watching Attack on Titan where they're just doing a lot of these like long drawn out anime sort of screams and they do things where they're just fluctuating their voice wildly and I have a really hard time imagining AI able to do that anytime soon. People and what have I mean no idea how hard that is. It's so, so hard. hard. So it's so hard. hard. So if it's like a little shopkeeper in a video game going, "Welcome to the store." What can I show you? Yeah, AI will be able to replace that. And, and frankly, it probably already could to a degree. It might not sound like as good as a AAA studio of a professional voice actor, but if it's a small indie game studio with a relatively low budget, they'll probably start implementing those things into the game. If it's a Dragon Ball Z anime sort of character that actually has to do something really drawn out and really fluctuate their pitch and their voice, there's just... I have a really hard time imagining AI is ever going to replace something like that anytime soon. Because I just can't imagine the way I understand machine learning and how it learns. I don't understand how someone would ever programmatically tell the character like when to use different voice inflections in different parts. And I've seen programs that are trying to attempt it. But right now, frankly, it sounds pretty bad. Here's where I'm going to put it, give you a gentle pushback. Just because we don't value the shopkeepers, hey, welcome to the store, mm -hmm. doesn't mean it isn't actually important to your game. And so it's there, there will be a threshold. And let's be honest, it's probably going to be based on budgets about which characters get to still have priority, which work still gets to have priority. One of the big risks of using AI on early development stuff is that if you do, you are not training the people to do the next generation of work. We all have to learn how to do our jobs. And so if all if if this if the simplest work, if the lowest status work is immediately all given away, there's nobody learning how to do the mid-level and high-level work. Hmm. And then you're only going to be left with the people who've already been doing it or the people who are so expensive that it's worth bringing them in to market your game on like celebrities. Yeah. Um, and so it behooves all of us who are creating together to remember that part of what we are doing is creating this game and part of what we are doing is keeping our industry alive. And so it's hard I know whenever anybody is creating something for themselves, they're like, yeah, but I need to get this thing done. But if we can also somewhere in the back of our mind, keep the global picture of, okay, I could pay a licensing fee to an AI company of questionable quality, or I could go to a pay to play site, like a, a lay, like a low budget one, like a, like a Fiverr. There will always be people who want to create with you. Don't steal from them. Don't make people work for free. Don't don't take their work and then sell it on to another project. But there's always room. I, I like to think of it as the student film model. Like there's always people who are like, I just want to be part of making something. So let's make it together. It's the thing where it's like, oh, I, I bought my AD2020 mic and my Scarlett Focusrite uh, interface so that I've got the best material that's available to me right now and I'm going to bring it to your project and I'm not going to charge you for it, right? Because every voice actor is already invested in your project because they paid for their space, they paid for their mic, they paid for their gear, they paid for their um, their sound protection, they paid for their training, right? They paid to be on those pay-to-play sites so that you can find them, right? They are already invested in your project. They've already paid into the system to help you make stuff, right? So when, so you have the option, right? Of here are people who are already invested who want to do stuff with me, or I can buy something. And if you buy something, it behooves you to buy an ethical product. And you have to do the research to find out who is getting their input into machine learning from ethical sources. There are people, there are actors who are signing contracts to license their voices. Some of those contracts are unethical, some of them are ethical, but as long as they have signed them with consent, that is legitimate. Mm -hmm. When an actor goes onto a project, because we are seeing these clauses already, that they sneak a clause in somewhere on like the third page in the fine print that says, and any voice doubles or dupes or copies or, uh, there's so many different words that they use that basically mean we can 
copy your voice and then sell it on to somebody else or use it in a future game. That's the stuff that I and a lot of my cohort are pushing back again. Out of curiosity, I would just kind of, just to kind of play devil's advocate, if you will, not to like necessarily take this stance myself, but just to play devil's advocate. As far as like the morality of like another human learning uh, how to like impersonate another human's voice, if that's what you want to call it. I don't know if that's the best way to phrase it necessarily. Like, what would you say is the difference between another human taking years and years and years or decades of practice to do that if a computer kind of does the same thing, but just does it faster? That doesn't necessarily make it immoral. The only person who benefits from hiring a computer, and because you gave me the example of a voice double. No. You didn't give me an example of a neutral voice. The yeah. only person who benefits is the person who gets to own something that they didn't make. They bought the voice of somebody they didn't know, they didn't work with, they didn't pay, they didn't create with, they aren't on a team with. If you hire an actor to do a voice double, you are collaborating with that actor and you are paying them for their work. If you pay a computer, which is paying somebody, but it's not the person who created the work, it's not the person who did the work and created the skill that you love. You're, you're looking for a voice because it means something to you. That person is getting nothing from you, from that, I should not you, from that creator, right? When you hire a person, you are in community and collaboration with a person. When you hire a computer to take something distinct that someone else created, including their voice, that person is getting nothing, and the and the cre and the creator of the game is getting everything. Does that feel right? And, and for a lot of those types of questions, like I feel like you know, I do my best to be a moral person, whatever that means, right? And a lot of the times, I see other certain examples of, let's say, AI voice acting, and sometimes it feels slimy, and sometimes it doesn't. So like, yeah. And I think <laughs> the difference is, at least the the place that I'm kind of at at this point, I think the the difference is. Is it consent? And what is it that you think you're buying? If you think, if what, if you're like, I have to have Peter Cullen to do my robot car. Are you hiring Peter Cullen? Are you hiring that kid from TikTok who does a really good Peter Cullen impression? Yeah. Or are you hiring somebody who created a company who scraped everything Peter Cullen has ever said off the internet and they're the ones getting the benefit of it. So Rachel, do you feel, just to clarify, do you feel that the person from TikTok who can do a good impression, that's okay to do that? That's ethical to do that? Or you think that is still not, not okay? If it sounds like someone, then that someone should have the right to either financially benefit from it or to say yes or no, I agree with this. Is it okay to sound like someone? I, it's okay it to sound like someone. I think in some cases you get what you pay for. And if somebody has learned how to do a voice but hasn't learned how to act, you're not getting a great actor. Peter Cullen is a great actor who has a great voice. Right. I, if you are a person who's learned to do a Peter Cullen impression but hasn't learned to act, then you're, you're not gonna get a great actor, you're gonna get a good sound. It's been announced already, my husband is working on, I, I like using examples of him instead of me. <laughs> He's working on the new X-Men 97. Um, some of the original actors are back. Some of them are back in different roles. Um, none of them are announced, I'm not gonna say anything about anything. Some of the actors are dead. Mm -hmm. So what are you gonna do? It's a throwback show that's meant to sound like the original show. So sometimes you can't get some of those people back. Of course, it's ethical to have another actor come in and do their best, right? Of course it is. Some of them, their voices have changed. Voices age, people age. Even Peter Cullen can't do Peter Cullen from 1983 forever. It's been a long time since 1983. It doesn't, it doesn't sound, it doesn't do the same. Of course it is okay for someone else to do it. I certainly hope that if it's a full budget union project, you talked to Peter first. I hope so, but that's not always possible, right? And the difference is still, are you paying a person to work with you or are you paying a company that stole someone else's life work so that your work goes faster? And that's a big difference. It's different when you pay an actor who has licensed their voice to an AI company. There are actors doing it. 
it's totally ethical to buy those licensed voices. Buy them with an ethical license that says I'm licensing licensing it for this game. And if we do a sequel, I will license it again for this game. That is totally ethical. When you partner with a company that has scraped the internet for performances without consent of those performers, and now they are the ones financially benefiting from someone else's life's work, that is unethical. I, I think almost all people uh, in our industry or parallels of our industry would agree with everything you just said with a resounding I yes. So. Um, I was actually just listening to another conversation that Rick was just having the other day, and he mentioned something pretty close to word for word as far as what you just said. So I think Rick, you're brilliant. We're, you know, we're trying hard to not make like an official stance of GameDev.TV necessarily because things are just changing so fast. And we're right. frankly, we're trying to find our own official stance and find our own voice and where we belong in all of this because things are changing so fast. Mm -hmm. But there are companies out there that just go out and scrape other artists' work and take it um without their permission yes, that's there right. are other companies it's out there theft. it's just theft it's we're, plagiarism we're a, it's theft we're in a phase at the moment where uh i think we're trying to find what is what's the right thing to do mm -hmm. and not have it too wrapped up in what should we do because right. what should we do isn't going to cut it when you've got people out there saying i've got a budget of three dollars and i need to get a thing done i'm just going to go you know my three dollars can get me that they're not going to look at the full extent they've they've got a need so they're going to satisfy that need so i think sometimes when we get moral about this and say you should do this and you shouldn't do that that's cool but capitalism and people's needs and you know you've got to look after this guy first people will go off and do what they're going to do i think we can look out for like some things we can do practical things we can do if you're if you're working with something machine learning that has a, a data set that's been trained and you know it's been trained in an ethical way, people gave their rights to have the model be trained. For now, I think we can search out for those things and we can shine the spotlight on those things that haven't done that. And I think there's a reality that I wanna draw a parallel to torrenting movies or music. And I think everyone has an awareness of that. None of us have ever done that, right? None of us have ever gone and torrented anything. I literally don't ever. know how. I and, honestly yeah. don't even and know. So th it's good that there's a bit of a technical barrier there as well. It makes it a little bit tricky to do. But I know that in, in previous years, that was huge. That's how a massive amount of people got their entertainment. They would just go and I'll have that movie, thanks. They would torrent it. And that's that's stealing, that's Ill that's illegal, but it's not something that someone's going to get caught for necessarily. You get caught if you're uploading and hosting and stuff, but not if you just go and grab one or two. So it's, it's, it's morally- It's still stealing, but it, you might not get caught. It is still stealing. I think, it, yeah, it is still stealing. But what I believe is there's been a trend where as the Netflix model has become more prominent, where people can pay 10 or $20 and get all the movies they ever wanted, then they don't need to go and steal it because there's an alternative, there's a solution, right. there's something that makes sense to them. And they're like, I never wanted to go steal this stuff anyway. Like I can afford 10 or $20. And so I think the industries that we work in need to find that the path of least resistance has to be organized in a way that isn't just saying, don't do the wrong thing. Do you see a model when it comes to voice acting that can be that the Netflix alternative? So. Yes, sure. I don't have the budget to go and pay for a professional voice actor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I never would have done that. But, oh, here's something I can do where I can just go and steal, you know, by using this AI that I think was not trained ethically. I can go and steal it. What's, what's in between? What is it that, that the regular person can do, do you think? I mean, I think the in between is identify which companies are paying actors to license their voice. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. Identify. There are companies who are doing it, and they will tell. They will tell you that they're doing it. Now, some actors are signing contracts. Personally, I would not sign. But that's on them. Yep. Some some of these companies are offering numbers that I'm like, are you aware that you just gave up your voice forever for yeah. two thousand dollars? I wouldn't sign that contract. But they did sign that contract. That voice yep. is now available to you. The answer is pay the people that you're working with, even if it's a little, <laughs> right? And if you're not gonna pay the people that you're working with, go through a legitimate portal, like a like a pay to play site or like a, I think there used to be a board on 
Reddit that was something like free voice acting. Like there were literally places oh. where people were like, I just want to do my first work. The answer is go to where you can collaborate. Buy a voice from a company that is buying voices. Don't buy a voice from a company that's stealing voices. Yep. It's just not that complicated when it so comes to So what I think is going to be the road of least resistance, at least in the very near future, because I can, you know, I already see it happening in a lot of these different programs that are being released. And I'm curious just to kind of see where you fall. Like, it, is this pushing it on the morality side of things? Like, is this okay? The, the road of least resistance will probably be company A comes along and hires 24 voice actors to basically come in and just rehearse days worth of lines that they can then train their model on. So that way the user from the front end, like the me that pops in, is just going to pay the $15 a month to the company to generate infinite voices or excuse me, infinite voice lines from those 24 different artists. Right. And those 24 different artists, like you said, might have only pay, been paid by the company once. Like, right. I, I don't know what it's, it is. I'd imagine sometimes it's $200 and sometimes it's $20,000 or whatever, but just once. So they don't have like an ongoing licensing fee, but the front end user is paying $9.99 a month to create an endless amount of voice lines from those actors. Right. Is that okay? Uh, I don't like it, but it's naive to assume that it's not going to happen. And there are definitely actors who are riding the train of like, if they're going to steal it from me anyway, I'm going to be the one to sell it to them right now. Right. Cool. And I know actors who've done that, who are so scared that they will be stolen from, that they are selling their life's work at an incredibly low rate. And I, that bums me out. Hmm. It's naive to assume that somebody isn't going to come in with a predatory model because yeah. predatory models be what is um but 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 you my creators out there don't have to be predators you can choose to do things differently um somebody is going to do it there's a lot of fear that ai is going to take my job there's a lot of fear out there at the moment and the one thing that i've managed to narrow down in my research is that if you feel that your job, your role, your skill set is going to become a commodity, then now's the time that you need to find what aspect of you can not be a commodity. So for example, in AI art, the art now, you know, creating a simple 2D anything just happens instantly. So that's going to become a commodity. If previously you could do that really well, ah, like the horrible truth is that you, that you can do that a click of a button with no skill. In, in your industry, in acting, in voice acting, do you have anything you can identify that you feel is going to become a commodity in the short term so that we can be giving guidance to folks and saying, okay, okay, that's going to go away, but here is the opportunity. When, whenever a new person shows up on the scene is like, people keep telling me, well, I'm a waiter, that I have a great voice. I want to, should I be a voice actor? The answer is universally, I don't know, are you a good actor? <sighs> like, you're going to have to learn to be an actor. If you're, people who are already good actors can step into the voice acting space and they still have to figure out how to perform only in the microphone. And that's really hard for some actors. Um, I, I always joke when I teach, I'm like, this eyebrow serves me really well on camera. It does nothing on the microphone. <laughs> So it doesn't matter how much I use my eyebrow <laughs> on the mic. I had to learn how to how to craft my performance so that every part of my performance gets into the mic. That's harder than people think it is. Yeah. Um, so good acting will always be good acting and good acting is something people will always look for yeah. for major characters and roles and characters that interact with each other. There are plenty of NPC style characters where it's not that important, um, where the, the human element isn't going, you, you assume it's not going to mean as much. Okay, I'm gonna give you an example. One of my specialties, one of my most marketable commodities right now is probably something that's gonna go to AI. I am extremely good at doing call outs in games like Call of Duty. You have heard me yell on your left, to the right, grenade, frag out in so many first person shooter games. Some of which I'm not even credited on. <laughs> I am extremely good at that skill because I can show up and I can, and I can do that shout 
And not only can I do it in a way that is easy to understand on mic and that cuts through the background sound of a game, but also I don't blow out my voice in two hours. I can do a full two or four hour session and get you all the lines that you need in my session where other actors haven't figured out how to support that sound. And so they blow their voice out and then you have to keep bringing them back or it doesn't sound good or it starts to sound really froggy, right? I have a very specific, extremely marketable skill that probably is going to eventually go away because call outs are not acting. Hmm. Call outs yep. to make them sound right in game need to be clear and understandable and cut through, which means the most common direct I'm like trying to get out of the window. Yeah, I see that. Are you guys I'm like starting yeah. to get I'm like I'm like try I'm not trying to creep in on you. I'm trying to sorry. <laughs> I need shades for my window. Um it is an extremely marketable commodity for me because right now my ability to do that makes a makes game developers' jobs so much easier. Mm -hmm. But eventually me or somebody else will license that skill to them so they can recombine grenade in as many different contexts as they want. Or I will do it once and they will pay me a new fee for each game they drop it into, which is effectively what they do now when I do Black Ops 3 and Black Ops 4 and do, you know, Infinite Warfare. I do like I have trained my body and my voice to be able to do that thing. So I can come in and just do it. What I'm seeing at the moment, just in our industry, we teach people game development, training courses, et cetera, um, is that I can go and record my own voice or mm -hmm. there's enough of me out there. I could just use my own videos and then I could have the AI speak as me. It sounds just like me. Sure. And at the moment, it doesn't have the nuances. It still sounds robotic. So it's clear uh, that's, that's AI doing that. I assume soon it won't sound that way. They'll they'll improve, they'll perfect it, they'll model it, etc. So then I don't have a need for anyone else. I can just record me into my microphone doing all those things that you're talking about that a voice actor might do. And then I can ask the AI to make it sound more masculine, more feminine, more, more um, worried, more excited, because I think AI is going to have that skill set as well to do that, not by stealing um, from other sure. artists, but you know, one person comes into the studio who's a trained actor and does all those different emotions, trains the AI, and then there's the skill set to say, you know, we can tweak the, the, you know, we can change it to make it sound higher, lower, masculine, feminine. So I can do that myself from home. This is this is the sort of example of what I'm worried about across many, many, many industries. The same thing happening for 3D artists, for 2D artists, for, for programmers, that anyone with zero, zero, zero skills can just get there and talk into a microphone and be like, you know, hey, we've got to get to the chopper and then click a couple of buttons and it sounds like dynamic, amazing. And so then if we say, if we have a model which is based upon today's model, we're going to get overtaken. So what I'm desperately looking for out there in the community is how do we help people reskill or repoint their focus to say, this is the bit that AI is not going to replace easily. Go get really good at that. You've got a year or two before, you know, your commodity part gets replaced, hopefully, maybe. So go get really good at this stuff. That's what I'm searching for in so all these conversations. I think it's going to be a very long time before somebody who's bad at talking can come in and say, get to the chopper, and it come through with an emotion that you care about. Yes, it might I, be able to convey the information. Yep. Yep. And so the stuff that's conveying information, like I've seen YouTubers feed videos of themselves in, I think ill advisedly, into one of these machine learning things and see themselves come back or hear themselves come back because yep. they are talking at a regular rate, at a regular pace, mm -hmm. sometimes with more energy, sometimes with a little less, but basically just talking for information. Right. And so it sounds an awful lot like them. Mm -hmm. um, what you're not going to get is the accidental connections between two actors on a set when something special happens that mm. isn't in the lines. It's in the relationship between the two people who spoke. The, <laughs> the thing that's really hard to say is like, if you want to survive in this business to steal a line from Steve Martin, be so good. They have to hire you. Yeah. Hmm. Be a good actor. And and 
there is still going to be stuff that's that's going to be taken away. And this is what I was saying at the beginning, the thing that's a problem and it's going to be a problem for everyone. And I'm expecting this to be like a bubble that bursts and then it comes back around in, in like 10 or 12 years when only rich kids can do this job on both ends is that there's going to be more and more and more training of the AI and more and more stuff. And it's going to get better and better. And then it's all learning the same crap. Everything that's been fed into it is already in it. And the only stuff getting fed back into it is the stuff that's been made with the stuff that was fed into it. Mm -hmm. And the bubble will burst on that. It's not going to get better at a certain point. It might get so much better than it is now. I've heard some of, I think they're apples. I might have that wrong. They're um, audiobook narrators. Yeah. And people are naive if they think some of that work isn't going to go away. Because some of those AI narrators are really good and they're going to keep getting better. And it's on Apple to not have stolen the material. They've got millions of hours of material that they can pull from. Did they steal it or did they buy it? I don't know. Sure. Um, but some of those narrators are, are good and they're going to get better. And if you are, say, a self-published novelist, who just who wants to be able to put out your self-published novel on the same day as your, your audiobook and you can't afford to pay uh, a narrator $250 an hour per finished hour and you don't want to deal with the the rights model for your book like I can understand why you'd be like only 16 people outside of my family are going to listen to this book anyway so I'm just going to have the AI do it hmm. and I'm not mad at you for it hmm. as long as that voice is purchased from somebody who purchased their I, training. I right. agree. That's that's always been my attitude towards software licensing. If you're a broke student, you know, get the student license or get it for free. Okay. As soon as you can afford it, pay for it. Yeah. Like I understand you can't tell people never steal the thing because they're going to steal it if they don't have the money. But um, go pay for it when you can. So it's the same. It, you know, if you've got a, a thing that only 16 people are going to see, maybe it's okay to do it a certain way. But as soon as you're making money out of it, pay people appropriately. Here's where the bubble is going to burst. If you don't have people learning to read books out loud, it's so much harder than people think it is. If you don't have people learning to do it, eventually you're not going to have people doing it except for the celebrities that you have to pay an exponential more amount to who skew the bell curve for everybody else. I really like what you're talking about. There's going to be a cycle. So, uh, and I've seen that where I live, I see that in trades, plumbers, carpenters, builders, etc. Sure. There was a real push X number of years ago, go off to university, go get a white collar job, that's success in life. And I think COVID's had a big impact on these things as well. But now it's so difficult to find the plumber, the builder to, to mm -hmm. do the stuff you need. And I can see smart people looking at it and saying, hmm, there's a big opportunity there. I like being outdoors and using my hands. I'm going to go do that. So I think these things do go in cycles. And so at some yeah. point, there's going to be a gap with certain skill sets because AI is doing it, but oh, we still need people to be able to do certain aspects of it. Yeah. And, and I think in the arts too, people's tastes for what they consume also shift with these bubbles. There, there was, you know, there was the seventies where I think we can agree that film was extraordinary because film was being created by studios where the, the studio owners were filmmakers. Mm -hmm. And then they started getting bought by bigger and bigger studios. And so they became more and more like blockbustery stuff. And they were more formulaic because it was about the money that was coming in. And then there was the indie film backlash where people were like, I can't afford to make that budget. So I'm going to make my little tiny indie film. And then the indie films all got bought up by middle, middle budget studios. So now nobody can afford to make those anymore because they bought up all the distribution space, which then switched into the Netflix model. And now Netflix isn't paying anybody. So everybody is, it's, there are all these shifts, right? And now people are complaining about there's too many tent pole uh, superhero movies. So there's the backlash is already pushing against those things that made money there. It's like that terrible monologue and the devil wears Prada. Like these things are intrinsic and extrinsic. Like you like blue because we told you to like blue, but also then there's the backlash against the blue because the blue is everywhere. So you go looking for something else. So, who, you know, and like, mm. 
needing AI to make a certain kind of game because that's the only kind of game that you can imagine is eventually going to backfire because that's the only tool that people can afford. So what are you going to do instead? So my answer going way back is what would you actually like to see? I've had auditions recently for two different um, short films because they're challenging to make that are hand drawn 2D pencil animation. I would do it for free. I did one of them for free because I am so excited about seeing that kind of craftsmanship and I want to watch something made with that craftsmanship. So I will give you my art so you can make yours. What do you want to see? Do you want to see the same thing that you've been seeing or do you want to see something special? Work on that. Maybe you don't have Mm -hmm. it yet. Maybe it's going to take time, but work on that because that's what people are going to want when this is the only tool everyone's using. When I first saw a lot of these things, I was like, that's really cool. And then very quickly, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to absolutely flip the world upside down. And now I've actually gone all the way back around and I'm like, these things are really cool. So I've I've had kind of my own full cycle and I'm excited to see what comes and I'm gonna keep evolving and keep changing and keep trying to remain relevant as I can. But it's important to have these kind of conversations internally and with others in the industry because of that exact reason. We're all learning and trying to figure it out together. Yeah, Rachel, I'd like to I'd like to wrap up and get your final thoughts, like your last nugget of wisdom to give people out there watching. For me, my thoughts, talking to you, listening to you and seeing the creative industries that we're all in, there's some things that are going to go away. And I would say my recommendation to viewers is don't fight the fact that it's going to go away. There's certain things that you wanted to do, for example, illustrate characters, for example, you know, do certain voices in a video game. It's just, that's not going to be a job in the future. However, there's new things opening up and keep your eyes for what is opening up, what the need is, what the opportunity is, stay ahead of it and get a secondary skill set. So if all you can do is illustrate, uh, there might not be a lot out there for you. But if you can illustrate and project manage, if you can illustrate and something, if if you've got that creative director outlook, not just the person who says, tell me what to do and I'll do it. So what's, what would be your, concluding thoughts to leave viewers with in terms of here's how we can help them not freak out about the future, but there is a path where we can still be creative, working our trade, being artistic without fearing that, well, in the future, it's just going to be robots and a bunch of people weeping in the corner. Like, what do we do? I think my hope for the future is that artists understand that we are the glue that holds society together. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna stand on that. What did we do when the world shut down? We all went to art. Yeah. We read, we watched movies, we played games, we painted, we baked bread. What do we do? We make art, we share art, we consume art. We are artists together. We hold society together. We create the connections that make humans and society meaningful. Art was invented before fire. It was. So make art, make it smart, make it ethical, make it with people. Technology changes, everything changes. Most films aren't shot on eight millimeter anymore. Most most photos aren't taken on digi- on on printing anymore. I, I don't play on a Game Boy anymore. It's okay. Everything changes. But let's change together. Let's make stuff together. Don't fear that change is coming. Stay aware of what is happening so you can be a part of the conversation instead of left out. If you live in fear, you will not be a part of what is coming. If you move forward with intention and you pay attention, you can be a part of what is changing and you can do it well and you can do it right. And creativity comes by doing not just what's possible, but by what you need to do. Rachel, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you being here and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Rachel.